another day before me what will i behold if i'm sad or angry i know i'm not alone when i think i won't make it i remember your word and know i am protected and lose all my concern hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to new hope in the lord i'm reverend joseph your host tonight Thank you for watching our broadcast today. Um, I have a question for you. Um, do you have peace? Well, people, since the beginning of time, um, have been uh, questing peace. Since Cain killed Abel, the first murder that happened. And the peace that they're looking for is on the outside um, with treaties and so forth like that. But, the peace that I'm talking about, do you have peace within, within your soul? And if you don't, that means that you really haven't had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ because the scripture says he is the Prince of Peace. And in Isaiah chapter 26, 3, it says, I'll give him perfect peace whose mind is stayed on me because you trust in me. So if you don't have that peace, Jesus offers that peace. There was a man named Horatio Spatford. He lost a son at 17 years old to pneumonia. He was a very wealthy man, and there was a fire uh, in his building, and he lost half his fortune. Mm -hmm. Then his uh, four daughters and wife uh, went on a boat to England, and he didn't go with them because mm -hmm. he had to take care of the situation uh, with the fire uh, at his building. And unfortunately, there was a... Uh, accident on the boat with another boat and his wife survived but his four daughters died and when he went over to England to see his wife uh, the captain told him this is the area where your daughters were killed and he got on the top of the deck and he wrote a song and the song was is called it is well with my soul I'm going to read some of the lyrics to you when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like a sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, O oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part, but in whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. He had a horrible, horrible situations happen in his life. But he knew this life was temporal. And he knew that God gave him the peace. And he knew that his sins were nailed to the cross and that he'll not be judged for his sins anymore. And that brought peace and said, it is well with my soul. And so my guest, Ramona Foster, uh, she knows about the peace uh, in the midst of the storm. And she knows about it is well with her soul because her sins are nailed to the cross. Uh, thank you, uh, Ramona, for coming on and sharing your story uh, of how Christ has changed your life. So why don't you just start to um, share about your upbringing Sure. Um, I was raised in Charleston, South Carolina, and about, hmm, I was born 63 years ago. And so I had a wonderful life with my parents. I have two older brothers. And um, to be very honest, I didn't know what it was to be unhappy for a while because my upbringing was pretty, pretty nice. My parents, um, on the other hand, I did notice that they had a lot of um, struggle and strife in their marriage, but it didn't affect their love and their care for us as siblings and, and the children in the family. We, we were well taken care of. We weren't rich, but <clears throat> both my parents worked and I had a very good example of what it was to have good ethics and, and good character and godly character. Um, I would pass by my dad and mom's room in the morning and I would always see my dad start the day off on his knees in prayer. 
And um, my mother was just a dedicated woman. She, she just gave her life to her children, really. But I just noticed that they argued and um, they didn't, they weren't very happy. At least mommy wasn't very happy. And she made it known. And so I um, went to college and I went to a college in Voorhees, South Carolina. Um, and I came home and my, my dad was very ill. He almost died actually of um, pancreatic cancer. Well, not cancer, but um, it was, it was cyst, three cysts on his pancreas. So it was a very serious situation. And um, my testimony is really about my marriage to my husband, how God used my marriage. I want to ask you before we get into that, uh, uh, Ramona, um, when, when you were uh, growing up, did your parents uh, take you to church? Uh, oh, did, yes. Did you oh, hear yes. about Jesus? Yes. yes. Um, did, did you hear the born again message? Uh, uh, there and um, mm -hmm. how was your school uh, when you were going to school? Um, okay, you were in school. With, uh, how was your situation there? Um, the first question about church we always went to church, we were brought up in the church, a Baptist church. And in fact, my, my granddaddy was the sexton, he, he cleaned the church, he opened the church, he closed the church, and he, he was all, also a trustee. And it went on to my dad. My dad was a deacon and he became head of the deacon board. And then my mom played the piano for the church. She was the church um, choir director for um, a couple of the choirs, the children's choir and the regular choir. Um, I loved being in church. It was always something I just loved. And I do remember sitting in church. Yeah, well, the one thing that really always gave me a curiosity, um, you know, at the end of our service, they would always um, extend the right hand of fellowship for Christ. You know, that invitation to give your heart to Jesus. And I was around eight or nine years old. And all of a sudden, my brother, who's only 11 months older than me, he whispered something into my mom's ear and, and um, then he went to the front of the church to join the church as they called it. And when people would go up, they would, the deacons, a couple of the deacons would meet you and, and then they would take you back to a room. And I always thought when they took you back to that room, that something miraculous would happen because you know, you, you're giving your life to Jesus. And so they take you back to this room. And when I saw my brother do that, I, I said to my mom, what's he doing? And, and um, she said, he, she's going to, he's going to give his life to Christ. I'm like, I want to do it too. I want to do that. And I, and I did. And so when I went back to that room with the deacons, the only thing they said was, what's your name? What's your number? What's your address? So we can get, get you baptized. I was, I was so disappointed. I thought something truly miraculous and a, a change was going to happen right then and there, you know? And even though I was eight or nine at that time, a change did happen. I may not have experienced it in the physical, but something did happen as I began to grow. But going back to school, I, I went to school um, in the neighborhood, um, I, I ended up at, as I said, um, Voorhees College, and I had a great school experience. But that is how I came to Christ initially. So it was basically um, when you were just a, a little girl, you did. You were fortunate to hear the the, the message of receiving Christ in your life, because there's mm -hmm. so many churches uh, where um, they don't um, they don't share the truth of the gospel. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they have you cling to uh, whatever the denomination is uh, over um, over you know Jesus, and so as, as uh, let's just say when you're going in um, in grade school and high school, um, now you have Christ in your life. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the children there, um, not everybody has Christ in their life, right. and um, did they look at you as a uh, 
a different breed, uh, like uh, a lot of them uh, were, mm -hmm. and, uh, because you wouldn't partake in uh, what they call fun, which is actually the start of a hellish life. Well, I, I tell you the truth. Um, even though I, I know I gave my heart to the Lord, I don't believe I got the discipleship that I should have. M meaning, meaning that I still went to church. I participated in the children's choir. I was a soloist in the little children's choir. Um, I was in the junior ushers. So I, I really enjoyed serving at church. But I have to tell you, I felt as though something was missing. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, of course, once we give our heart to Jesus, the Holy Spirit enters into our hearts, the promise guarantee of the Holy Spirit. I didn't know that at the time, but I knew something happened because every night I felt this desire to get on my knees to pray. And, you know, this happened through, throughout my teenage years, even from nine, or nine years old up until then. And the only thing I would um, say was the Lord's Prayer. And I would pray for my family, but I had to do it every night. And I remember one night I, I, I was not going to do it and something inside of me said, no, you didn't pray, you need to pray. And so I was labeled a, a goody two shoes um, because I didn't participate in a lot of the things that, you know, people, you know, the young people did. It's, it's not as crazy as it is today, but still, I, I didn't feel the need to be rebellious or, you know, go out smoking or drinking or being promiscuous of any kind. Did you feel, and, did you feel uh, rejected in, um, as, a young, as a young girl? Um, with, uh, uh, did you feel like an outcast or uh, kind of alone because of that situation? I did not. I, I had other friends who, who were in the same category as myself. I didn't know if they were Christians or not, but they didn't partake, participate in those things. And, and plus my mom and I, we were very, very close. And so she, she kept me very close to her. I wanna ask you, um, uh, Ramona, you uh, were saying that uh, you were praying, uh, that you were in church, but they were, and you did receive God in you, uh, mm -hmm. you're, you're a believer, but, but there was an emptiness there. Mm -hmm. um, how did that emptiness become not empty? Okay, glad you asked that. Um, I kept seeking the Lord, and this is a very, very important part of my development, I believe God gave me. Um, and I, in the Baptist church I went to, every first Sunday we would, recite a litany of about 10 or 20 items. And the one item that always stuck out for me, when you depart from this place, reunite with another body of Christ, wherever you are. And that brought me, that, that really served me so, so well because when I relocated to New York at the age of 22, um, I was looking for a job and I was looking for the address to go to this interview and I ran into a gentleman, an older gentleman, and asked him, um, could you tell me where this address is? And he did. And he also said, um, I want to invite you to my church. And so immediately when I hit New York, God divinely orchestrated that I was going to be reunited at a church. And it was another Baptist church. And, and I, I believe the Lord gave me a really keen sense of discernment because I, I went to this church and I knew the presence of God was there. And so that's, that was a part of my journey of, of um, discovering what was missing. Because when I went to that church too, something was still missing even though I felt God's presence when the preacher preached, but there was something still missing from me. How did that something that was still missing from you, uh, which probably was the baptism of the Holy Spirit, um, how did that uh, take place in your life? Okay. 
Well, um, my husband worked at Medgar Evers College. Um, when he was about 25 years old, he, he began working there as a counselor. And then he became very quickly the Lord without us having this knowledge of God. Um, I should say we had the knowledge of God, but we, not the experience of God. And again, you know, the steps of the righteous are ordered of God, whether you know it or not. And he had a secretary because he became the director of this department. And his secretary invited him to a church in Brooklyn. We were living in the Bronx. And I used to listen to um, Charles Stanley back then. And I always remembered, he said this one thing about actively listening and passively listening. And my husband came home one day from work and he says, hey, Mona, um, Mary invited me to her church and um, it's in Brooklyn. And as I'm listening, and I was really passively listening because as he's telling me this church is in Brooklyn and we're living in the Bronx, I said to myself, um, very in my heart, not out loud, I said, um, why would I go to a church in Brooklyn and I live in the Bronx? Besides, I'm already attending a church. And, you know, like Mary, um, Jesus's mother, quietly pondered those things. I, I, I pondered those things in my heart. I just tucked it away. And God already knowing, you know, we've, we've been preordained. And God already knowing our destiny. Um, my husband and I ended up moving to Brooklyn. And we ended up moving, um, little did we know, we ended up moving about five blocks away from this church that we were invited to a years ago. And that's where you received uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit that filled the void in your life and, Absolutely. and changed uh, your life. And um, how, how long ago was that? Oh my goodness, that must have been back in 1988. So in other words, um, since 1988, you, you found uh, the inner peace and, and the um, contentment uh, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit brings uh, in the midst of storms in your life. Um, could you share some of the storms in your life? Because um, a tornado doesn't care how much money you have. Mm -hmm. doesn't care what uh, color you are on the outside, doesn't care what religion you are, or what the, uh, group you live, what a denomination you're in. A tornado doesn't care anything about you. It just comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And so uh, born-again Christians are just as susceptible to pain and trauma and trials as non-believers. And uh, so with the peace that you have in your heart uh, guides you and leads you and helps you uh, to be steady in the midst of the storms. Is there a couple of storms that you would like to share with us uh, today? Yes. Um, well, of course, the biggest storm that I went through, I grew up with a, a, um, a goal, a drive of wanting to have um, a perfect marriage because I saw such an imperfect marriage in my, my, my parents that I, I was just fueled that I wanted to have this perfect marriage. And so when my husband and I got married, you know, the very first year was wonderful, but then unfortunately he got introduced to crack cocaine back in the nineties when it was blaring. And, you know, he, if you were to meet my husband, you would never think that that would be his, his story. But crack cocaine, you know, is sin. Um, Satan doesn't care what it is and who you are. Right. And, and he got entangled in that. Um, and, and that began um, a 13 year nightmare of drug addiction. Um, but I can look back and, and I would never want to go through that again. But I know that I know that I know. The Lord used that storm in my life, like you were talking about, to 
draw me to him, to introduce the power of his, his love, his peace, and just the power of his Holy Spirit. And that was the, the element that was missing, but I got so introduced and experienced the power of, of the word, the power of, of learning how to practice his presence, the power of learning how to practice his voice, because I went to the King of Kings and my, my Abba Father to help me. The, the people um, hear something like this and they go, wow, that can happen to me too. But it's Christians who need to have that power within because the power within will keep your heart and your mind away from the natural. And it must have been difficult at times, uh, Ramona, for that to happen, especially because we are in the flesh. Mm -hmm. And if our hearts and our minds for that day uh, is not focused on the Lord, fear would come. Uh, did that grip your heart and your mind in these 13 years uh, more than you would want that to happen? Or were you more on, uh, on the steady side where when it came to you, you kind of rebuked it and the, the peace continued to flow? Well, I, I believe that those 13 years, were, it was a classroom of learning how to do what you just asked. And, and an example that I can give is, you know, when we first come to Christ, we give our hearts. But, you know, Romans um, 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world any longer, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we will know God's good and perfect and acceptable will for our life. And so although I was um, a, a born again believer, my, my mind had not yet been transformed. And so what my, my um, the tragedy of my marriage did for me was to draw me into a personal relationship, not a religion, not going to church, not serving in a choir, but learning how to pray and, and, and replacing whatever storm with God's truth, replacing whatever lie with the truth of the, of the word of God because it's, it's sharp and it's powerful. And, and I learned how powerful the word of God um, is and always will be. And so as, as I began to learn, then my mind became transformed. I didn't try to love my husband in my own strength. I learned how to love him in the strength of, of the power of God. And even though he had not changed, I had changed. And, and that's where my strength came from. And my happiness was not, no longer dependent on the condition of my marriage. My happiness, my joy came from my relationship in Christ. And, and that's the beautiful thing um, is that um, your joy did not come from another person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> your joy did not come from um, stuff. Mm -hmm. Your joy came from Jesus because the scripture says the joy of the Lord is your strength. And that's where you got your strength. So how, how's your marriage today? Praise the Lord. It's great. We've been married, Lord willing, it'll be 39 years, July 17th. And I want to ask you, um, um, are you and your husband um, counseling people who want to get married? Um, we have helped very much at our church, counseling people. In fact, um, we used to have a marriage group right here at our home for at least over 10 years. You would, and, never, you would never think of that happening yes. <laughs> ever, ever. <laughs> because uh, uh, dealing with drug addicts, with needles and stuff like that, uh, it's insanity. And, and uh, see, that's why God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts as high as the heaven is from the earth. So um, the advice I give to people who are believers, uh, don't try to figure God out. <laughs> right. Because you're going to just fall flat on your face. And um, so when your husband um, did get delivered, and I'm sure there was a lot of people praying oh, for, yes. for your husband, not just oh, you. Yes. 
because yes. the, the power of prayer is what it is. Mm -hmm. um, when that your husband came to you, or how did that um, situation evolve where you knew that he was finished with being this uh, addict? Okay. Well, he, he didn't have needles, praise God, but, but he had a pipe that he smoked crack from. Um, I was, as, as I said, um, I was always serving in ministry from a little girl. Uh, I was, I'm still on the choir at my church and they have um, a ministry called the prayer band. And so Friday night was when we had choir rehearsal and the prayer band would be, be upstairs, what they call the upper room at our church, it used to be the upper room. We, we've changed locations as of now, but um, I was very familiar with the prayer band because that was the very first place I went to when I went to this church. And so there was a security guard there and um, he was very instrumental, he, two of them actually. And my husband had come to pick me up from choir rehearsal that night. And it was very unusual to find a, a parking space right there in front of the church because it's a busy area. But the Lord orchestrated that parking space. And as soon as I saw him, I knew that he was high. And so I called the security guard and told him, hey, my husband's in this condition. And he took him into the sanctuary of the church and started talking to him because my husband was, he was attending church while in this condition. And so I want to encourage people, you know, even though they, the person has not been transformed completely or delivered completely, I should say, don't, don't feel discouraged because at least there is the process of them going. And, you know, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So he was there. And we were in marriage groups as, as well before we had our own. So um, he, the, the security guard encouraged him to go upstairs to the prayer room. And the, one of the ladies who's the leader, Dorothea said, what are you doing here? And, and he says, I wanna see the pastor. And then the pastor came up because we had a, a prayer band and then we had a praise band. The praise band was downstairs, the prayer band was upstairs and they were doing praise and worship and prayer simultaneously. So there was a stairwell and the pastor came up the stairwell. He says, why do you keep doing what you do? And he says, I don't know. He said, if you had said anything else, I would have just gone back downstairs. And he took him into his office at 12 o'clock at night. And from 12 o'clock until two o'clock in the morning or after two, he went from Genesis to Revelation. And when he came out of there, he believed. He said, he simply believed. So oh, um, this is a phenomenal testimony, uh, Ramona, of what you went through and, and for the pastor at midnight to spend two hours just, just goes to show the love of God in the pastor and he was delivered. And, and these are incredible testimonies about you and, and, and also your, your husband. Thank you so much for watching our broadcast today, Ramona. Appreciate you. God bless you. And ladies and gentlemen, um, You've heard it. You've heard the truth and you heard the answer. The answer is Jesus Christ. He's the way, the truth, and the life. You want peace in your heart? You want to have a joy and a love that transcends all what you could think or have through unnatural way? Receive Christ in your life today. Thank you for watching our broadcast. I know.